In this short video, I want to take on a very important aspect of the fixed income security market, the yield curve. Just going to cover the basics. So what is a yield curve? What can you interpret from its shape? And one or two of the sort of pros and cons of relying on yield curve to tell you about what might happen next, as some investors do. So the basics, first of all, a yield curve links the total return, usually the gross redemption yield, or yield to maturity as it's known, on bonds of a similar type, that's important, but with different maturities. And the curve can reveal how fixed income investors as a group basically see future interest rates. Are they expecting them to rise? Are they expecting them to fall? And they can also reveal one or two other things as well. And in certain situations, the yield curve, when it inverts, is quite a useful early warning indicator of potential trouble ahead, as seen by the so-called bond vigilantes, the bond market investors out there trading fixed income securities on a daily basis. So let's take a look at that. Um, basically, let's do some basics first of all. If you had a choice of four bonds from the same issuer and with similar risk characteristics, so that's quite important. So we're comparing apples with apples, but differing maturities. I've just picked four. How would you expect the returns to look? And the answer basically is this. Over time, you should be expecting to get a higher return for taking more investment risk. In other words, if I ask you to lock your money away for 30 years, you would expect normally on an annual basis to demand a higher return than you would if I ask you to lock your money away for two years or for five years. So broadly speaking, the normal situation is you would expect to see yields for bonds. Don't forget now the same issuer could be the UK or the US government, similar risk characteristics in terms of likelihood of default and so on. Um, but basically you'd expect to see a rising relationship and that's what you normally do see, as they call it. The normal yield curve shape therefore is something like this. If you were to take, let's say, UK government IOUs called GILTs and look at the total return, the yield available on a three month as opposed to a one year, as opposed to a five year, as opposed to a 30 year, you generally expect if you connect those dots, if you like, the shape to be something like that. In other words, investors are demanding a higher return annually for investing with something like a government over 30 years than they are for investing over say five, three months, or one year. That's the kind of relationship you'd normally expect to see. And that would reflect an environment where investors, for example, think interest rates in the future are likely to rise or more likely to rise than fall. Because if you think about it, if general rates of interest are going to start rising and you're going to lock in to something that's got a 30-year maturity with a fixed income, remember this is the fixed income IOU market, uh, you're going to want to be rewarded for doing that. All right? Because the income return on that fixed income investment isn't going to change, whereas interest rates, so rates available on, say, deposit accounts, anything with a variable rate of interest, are going to change. So in a nutshell, you'd expect the price of those longer dated securities to be a bit lower than shorter dated, and that's going to tend to push up the yield, hence the shape of the graph. Now, we do see that uh, at, the end of at the end of 2014, for example, in the US Treasury market. The shape isn't quite the same as the one I just sketched, but broadly it's you know, upward sloping, as they call it, reflecting the fact that at that point, that snapshot point, most investors expect uh, an increase in interest rates, the timing of which is uncertain, rather than a fall. And that will be the normal kind of market expectation. So why is it that when you look at a yield curve, it's not always that shape? And what do the other shapes actually tell you? Well, on the way to what's called an inverted yield curve, which, as the name suggests, is the exact reverse of what we've just seen, you get sometimes what's called a flat shape. So again, plotting time and yield, if you were to take just four bonds the shape, when you join the lines together, comes out more like that. Maybe not an exactly flat line, but in other words, you've seen at the short end, as they call it, yields starting to rise, and at the long end, yields starting to fall. And that can be an early warning indicator that the market's about to invert. And as the name suggests there, that simply may not be a straight line, but that's simply where, when you join up the dots, if you like, across different maturities, you get that shape. Now, it might be more like that shape, it might have a few kinks in it, 
but the principle is you're seeing lower overall yields on long dated stuff compared to short dated. All right, so what's happening there? How could that be? Well, there are several reasons why that can happen, but a key one is an expectation of lower interest rates. And we have seen this in the relatively recent past. Why does the yield curve invert? Well, basically, if investors in the fixed income bond market expect central banks to cut interest rates, suddenly, looking at something like a 30-year government-backed fixed income security, say you've got something there with like a 4% fixed coupon, that suddenly looks pretty attractive in an environment where other rates of interest are being slashed or cut. So investors are thinking, hey, if I lock in to that long maturity fixed income return, especially where it's backed by a UK US government, great, I want some of that. So in anticipation of falling interest rates from, say, central banks, investors pile in to the long ended, long end of the curve, the long dated stuff, go, thank you very much, I'll take that. And that, of course, that's the effect of driving up the price and driving down the yield. Now, is it all about interest rate expectations? Well, it is heavily driven by interest rate expectations. The shape of the curve tends to be driven by that, but there are one or two other factors in play, as I'll highlight in just a moment. The curve tends to invert when interest rates are expected to fall, tends to be normal when interest rates are expected at some point in the future to rise. Of course, no one knows for certain. It's bond market investors giving you their view in a snapshot, which is why yield curves are useful. What other factors could play? Well, there are quite a few, actually. Um, pension funds and other institutions that hold a lot of, say, government IOUs might decide to you know, pile in. So supply and demand is important. If there's suddenly a rush on for pension funds and other institutions to grab longer-dated, government-backed, fixed-income securities in order to be able to pay out you know, retirement uh, fund pensions and so on, that in itself would, for example, drive up prices at the long end, as it's called, and drive down yields. So that in itself can contribute to, towards what's called an inversion, and government intervention can do the same thing, depending on how and where governments intervene. So QE is a programme where central banks you know, buy, essentially, government IOUs from their own governments. That's going to, depending on which ones they go for, push up prices, drive down yields. The Federal Reserve tried a thing called Operation Twist, where it basically sold short-dated IOUs and bought longer dated in an attempt to move the shape of the curve. So government influence is always worth bearing in mind, and we've seen increasing amounts of that in the last few years. Now, just a final word, really, on another aspect of yield curves. If you can put one yield curve onto a graph, why not plot two? So you could start with a government yield curve, UK, US, and plot you know, three month, one year, five year, and 30 year, and see a nice normal upward slope. And then you could put another type of bond on against that over the same time frame and compare the two. And what you get is a spread. And just a reminder, I deal with this in more detail in another video. The bigger the gap there, the riskier whatever this is, the second one is perceived to be against the so-called benchmark bond at the bottom. And government IOUs are often used as a benchmark for riskier securities, whether that's you know, other governments or corporate issuers and so on. So that is also worth watching, the spread between two yields at different points in time. And there's another type of spread that matters too. You know, how steep a yield curve, if it's upward sloping is, is driven to an extent by how much extra reward investors demand for taking the risk of locking into longer dated securities. So essentially the pace of future interest rate rises, the expected pace will to some extent influence the steepness of the curve and therefore the shape of it. And uh, that can be sort of captured in another sort of spread, you know, comparing the yield gap between say five year and one year or 30 year and five year. So just a bit of jargon there to keep an eye on the two useful ways of interpreting what's going on between different yield curves or different maturities on the same curve. Usefulness, it's all quite useful. Um, from a, an investor's point of view, investors use the yield curve, first of all, as a signal as to where interest rates might, might go next and as an indicator of the pace of future rises or cuts, depending on which one we look, you're looking at. And that's important for both retail and corporate borrowers because, of course, what the bond market thinks will happen to interest rates in the future directly affects what could happen to your mortgage rate in the future if you're an individual, what could happen to your borrowing rate if you're a company. So yield curves are pretty key. 
You'll see them quoted fairly often. In future videos, we can deal with them in more detail, but there are all your basics.